Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. This is a Bright Talk sponsored webinar, uh, part of their Ask the Expert series. And uh, we've got a very interesting, broad, and, and central topic today getting serious about cybercrime. I'm Willie Leichter from Versec, and I've got a couple of real experts on the line with us today Joseph Carson from Psychotic, Chenzi Wang, um, who's uh, currently with the Jane Bond Project, but a long history I'll talk about in a moment. Um, as with any of these webinars, this is a panel discussion, so we encourage and would love to have audience participate, type in questions. Um, we will be having a pretty open discussion, wide-ranging, so we'd love to get your input, and we'll try to take as many questions as possible. And like all Bright Talk webinars, this is, is being recorded and be available for replay. So let me um, just quickly tell you uh, uh, 10 seconds about myself. Um, I am VP of Marketing for Versec, a start, very unique startup. We have a solution to secure any type of application or process essentially from the inside. We protect at the memory level, we protect the processes, a whole range of things that have been below the radar for most cybersecurity tools. So we got a unique perspective, a different approach to security that we think is valuable. And I've been around the security industry for, for a long time with a number of a number of companies in the valley here. Joseph Carson, I'll let him um, speak to for himself for a moment, but he uh, is with Psychotic, which is based in Estonia. Um, he's a chief security scientist, uh, has written a lot, spoken a lot on the topic. Um, just a couple of articles I've seen online, which I think are, read you the titles, 10 Ways to Protect Yourself from Cybersecurity Threats, Responding in the wake of a cyber attack, making cybersecurity everyone's responsibility. These could almost be questions for the webinar. So maybe, Joseph, if you could introduce yourself for a moment. Sure, many thanks, uh, and it's great to be here. Um, so I've, I've been in the industry now for more than 25 years, and uh, I'm an advisor for several governments and industries from critical infrastructure to maritime. And uh, as a chief security scientist at Psychotic, I primarily focus my time at helping organizations protecting and securing privilege accounts um, it's one of the main areas that many organizations need to protect, and it's very tightly tied to uh, industry regulations. So I myself am based in Estonia, but the company itself is uh, headquartered out of Washington, D.C. All right, and finally, Chenzi Wang, who um, I think knows everybody in the industry, <laughs> Dr. Chenzi <laughs> Wang. She has a Ph.D. in computer science from Carnegie Mellon. She's a former analyst at Forrester Research. She's worked for a number of companies. She is a board member of OWASP. She won a Women of Influence Award, one of the SC awards, and now a managing partner um, in a capital fund investing in tech companies. So, Chenzi, please uh, expand on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Willie. Um, we work together, so it's it's really fun to to come together and do the webinar again. Um, like Willie said, I've uh, had had a number of positions in the cybersecurity industry. Most recently, I founded the Jane Bond Project, which is a cybersecurity consultancy that we help not only end user companies but also solution providers um, on their strategies and protection techniques and uh, the whole gamut that is. Uh, connected with cybersecurity strategies, um, and very excited to uh, speak on this project, uh, speak on this topic today, because I recently got into uh, looking at uh, online crime in the Asian market, which is, uh, has a very unique uh, and different characteristics than uh, what we see here, so I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing that. Great, and we'll, we'll definitely get into that and a range of other things. So let's uh, jump right into it. Um, so maybe broadly, I'll let each of you guys, you know, tell me the, the top cyber crime issues today. Um, it, it, and I'll just, you know, opine a little bit. It seems like the problems never get solved, or the minute we solve them, there's some new technique, some new exploit. Um, I don't know if that's just perception, but it doesn't feel like things are getting better. But um, maybe, Joseph, you could start. You know, what, what are people worried about now? What are, the, what are the top things that people are losing sleep over? Sure, absolutely. And one of the main top causes that, and, and worries that many businesses that uh, have today, of course, is ransomware. Uh, the main factor that ransomware is, 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 is both hugely financial cost to an organization and at the same time very destructive to the business. So, you know, most companies are really worried where it has a financial cost and also downtime to the business and operations. So that is very on the top of it, a lot of organizations' minds. 
and we've seen serious, you know, impact in recent years where it had, you know, many organizations in up to 300 million in regards to damages. So ransomware is definitely the top of mind. Second to that is is financial fraud, is where we're seeing a lot of invoice fraud and a lot of organizations being, um, you know, abused and, and getting compromised out of giving money away. Uh, so a lot of organizations are starting to see a huge financial impact from that. Um, so yeah, a lot of areas where we see financial impact is where CISOs and CEOs are really worried. And then after that, the third part, which is really around data loss and data, data kind of leakage. Um, most of that is, you know, not so much a huge financial rep- uh, issue, but more of a reputation or brand issue where they do lose customers, which also does have a impact to their financial situation. All right, great. Yeah, and, I, and Chen, yeah, obviously, same question. Please jump in. But also, what you know, a lot of these problems seem like they've been around forever. What is it? The same old, same old? Are you seeing new things? Um, I think they are new in the sense of if you read the headlines, uh, not only the frequency has uh, evolved, we the ransomware nature has uh, really changed as well, right? So, the what we're seeing is ransomware uh, attacks are hitting. Systems that have uh, often has a physical component to it, right? So you have a converged environment with physical equipment and digital assets, and that's where um, when you get hit by ransomware, like Maersk, right? So you you could have a ship that's stranded in the middle of the water, or an MRI machine that is not able to operate. And if you are stuck in this space that in this place that you have to save life at this moment. Do you then make the decision of pay ransom, or do you make the decision of not saving life? It's it's a really really difficult thing to do, and I think the nature of attacks has changed. And also um, another thing I want to add to what Jill said is that many of the online fraud nature has also evolved, um, going from maybe a small scale to to internet scale coordinated uh, abuse or fraud. Um, so in Asia, for instance, we see a huge increase in promotion abuse, and and some of the crime groups are able to. Uh, really get millions of dollars in those large-scale attacks, and I think that is um, actually only going to increase in the future. Let me also ask, uh, Joseph, do you see any, you know, new types of tools or tricks that are being used? You know, we we know about phishing. It still is an ongoing problem. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much virtualization, so much in the cloud. Are you seeing, you know, it is... There a technology change here in the in the hacking technology. In the hacking technology, really, what's what's happening more is, you know, we always assume that in in the defensive side, we're assuming that artificial intelligence and machine learning is helping us defend against cyber attacks. But on the other side, you know, hackers and cyber criminals, they you know, those tools are also available to them. And what they're actually using that that for is actually to make sure that their targeting is much more specific and much more successful. They're also using it to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes like in, when we had the Bank of Bang- Bangladesh when they spelled foundation incorrectly. Those mistakes will not happen now because of you know the improved um, use of data and making right. sure that they have more personalization and more uniqueness to the individual that they're targeting. So not really much more tools, but much more refined in regards to the targeting and the actual personalization is getting much more accurate. And as well as the language translation as well, they're starting to get better language translation so they have not just the English or language impact, but they're able to do it across the globe for every, uh, you know, every language as well. Yeah, Chen, I, a lot there. Yeah, <laughs> I, and I would add to that is not only the uh, methods are getting more sophisticated and targeted, um, they also um, have this characteristics of moving to sort of a, a uh, hitting the weak spot, right? So, for instance, in some of the promotional uh, pro- promotion abuse cases that I've seen, uh, because they're, they're moving from attacking the software to attacking business logic. 
and um, and often these promotions that that online vendors run are often one off and and fairly unique to the nature of the product, right? Some of them are rebates, some of them are uh, basically money back to your account. So there's um, in terms of machine learning and detecting patterns today, there's not really good historical data for us to learn from, and, and what that means is. Supervised machine learning techniques or models are, are often ineffective against these one-off promotion campaigns, and and that's where the the fosters come in and and take their um you know take their their share, and so that forces company to rely on sort of simple rules and sometimes uh, manually uh, manual work to stop abuse, and and that becomes really difficult to do. Just, All just right, to, please yeah, go ahead. Just, just to add to that, I think it's also important to understand, one, uh, while hackers, one of the, the, the changes that's happened in, in recent times as well, and more so in the last two years, is that um, there's been a lot of move to actually hackers prefer to, rather than to making money or financial that is easy traceable, um, there's been a motive and a, a switch to making where they're actually making the money legally, which is more difficult to trace. And what we're starting to see is that hackers are breaking into two companies and organizations, and rather than actually being destructive or doing you know financial fraud internally that you know becomes easily visible over time, then what they're doing is they're actually making the actual criminal activity is by looking at financial data and financial results, and they're actually then making uh, investments in the organization's performance. So they're actually starting to do what was traditional insider trading. Um, hackers are now having access to that sensitive information, are actually making legal trades in the stock market, which is much more difficult to actually trace and detect and also you know, determine the legal activity there. Very hard to undo also. Interesting. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, a, lot, a lot here, and we'll come back to a lot of these things. But, um, you know, when – and I apologize for my typo here, but – Oh, no, it just got cut off. Law enforcement. So a lot of people, particularly in the press, I think there's a big attack. Everybody wants to know who did it, you know, what, who are the bad guys, where are they, how do we catch them, how do we stop it. Um, and attribution is, is, you know, I guess the first instinct is to try to figure out what happened. But I'm wondering is, from a business perspective, is finding the source, is finding attribution really useful? Maybe, Chen, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I think um, largely speaking, attribution is a really difficult problem, and we've seen it um, happening in the press, and, and but a lot more is actually happening behind the media articles. Um, so I think companies shouldn't try to do attribution by themselves. Um, it's a, a sort of little bit dangerous activity to undertake by yourself. However, Technical attributions are um, useful. For instance, you know, dissecting the malware, detecting where the source of the malware comes from. Does the malware have a code base that has been reused in other malware? And then understand that what was the uh, effective techniques that defended against the other type of malware that maybe you could borrow it. That's that's interesting, and and I think that's useful, and meaningful. And there's also I've seen cases where uh, companies are able to, for instance, detecting the signature of the malware uh, to the degree that they're able to trace back to certain behavior of criminal groups, and they know where the criminal groups were uh, largely operating from. So they were able to do IP blocking uh, in the way that you know, a lot of companies do country-level IP blocking, which, you know, may or may not be very effective, but what this company was able to do is was able to do fine-grained IP blocking. So they were able to say, okay, um, traffic from this state of that country we're going to block. And now it doesn't work in every case, but in this case, those technical information contributed to effective defense, and I think that kind of attribution is useful. All right, interesting. and, and um it seems like, you know, obviously law enforcement you would hope would be more involved, but there are a lot of challenges there, and often they're not going to communicate <laughs> what's happening necessarily. But, Joseph, any other, any other thoughts on this, on attribution? 
Uh, absolutely. And this is actually one of the areas I, I work in heavily. I, I do a lot of digital forensics and, and I have a kind of different approach. I mean, I, I think that organizations should not get involved in at all in attribution. Um, attribution is one of the most difficult things in cybersecurity. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years and it's very difficult to actually bring anything to a prosecution. Almost, it, it very rarely even happens unless it's actually from a government extradition order. So organizations of business um, should primarily, their prime focus should actually be just getting back to business and closing and eradicating the vulnerability or the way that the actual uh, cyber criminal gain access. Their main focus should be actually be their customers, their employees, their partners, and the business that they operate in. Yes, they should inform and work with law enforcement in order to help them actually uh, get the data for the law enforcement to do attribution, uh, but all attributions should be left uh, in the hands of governments and law enforcement and national authorities. And the organization should, of course, help provide assistance in the data to help find that. Um, most organizations today, you know, pointing fingers is, is not going to get any way out of the responsibility. Um, in m most cases, I find that most hacks, there's a lot of misdirection left as well. So even if you try to find attribution, you're going to be actually left into going to somewhere where the hackers actually want you to go. They want you to point fingers at different countries and different political organizations. So because they leave breadcrumbs and they leave, do the misdirection and they try to um, hide the, the criminal activity to point you somewhere else. So I find that attribution, yes, to, to close the door and to, to close the vulnerability, how they get in the first place. Um, but that's as much as it goes. Law enforcement should be the ones responsible for that. Yeah, interesting, and I'll just commentary that I get. Oh, please, go ahead, Jenzy. I have a slightly different view on that, and I, I agree on the, uh, you know, sort of the large extent of it. Law enforcement should be the first layer of defense um, in terms of really taking down the criminal group and identifying it. But uh, the, the way law enforcement deals with them often does not lead directly to a technical defense. So, so what do you – what then the company has to do, right? So it, it, it doesn't give the company an immediate way to say, okay, uh, by install this signature or by doing this, uh, it, install this network rule, I'm uh, at least somewhat uh, protected. So I think companies have to do certain things to protect themselves. And if you sit around, wait for law enforcement to do the work for you, you are up the creek without a paddle. <laughs> no, my, 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 point, my point was more law enforcement should be the responsibility at, at communicating who did it or the attribution. Um, the organization, yes, should actually be, be making sure that how the criminal got in the first place, they close that door. They, they, they mitigate the vulnerability. Um, but that's as far as they should go because it's just – I can tell you now it's a waste of time for an organization to try and do digital forensics to find out who did it. Um, it's basically a waste of resources. They can put that resources in more into uh, instant response and remediation and also then making sure that they can continue business. Um, otherwise, they, they very rarely will find prosecution as a result. So, Joseph, that's a perfect pivot into the next question or, you know, so law enforcement should do more. Obviously, we have, you know, a dysfunctional global law enforcement system or we don't have a global law enforcement system. So how do, you know, what are some of the implications there? I, I know it's a big question. Yeah, most, most cyber crime today is cross-border. That's the fact. Um, it, it, sometimes it, it goes cross-border and then comes back in again. You know, that, that does happen as well. So sometimes you do end up finding, you know, the, the source of the actual crime within in the country, but it did leave the borders at some point. But the majority of cyber crime, it does cross borders. And the challenge we have today is that most of those crimes are coming from countries where it's not an illegal activity. It's not a criminal act in those countries. And or that some of those criminal groups are you know, working for multiple, wearing multiple hats. Sometimes they're doing good and sometimes they're doing bad and sometimes they're working for governments and sometimes they're working for financial, their own motivation. So really want to get into is that we have a real big challenge. And of course, we see in, in Europe, we get involved with Europol and of course, then with Interpol. Um, but we don't have a global consensus, a global transparency of cooperation in cybercrime today. And that's something that really needs to happen to the point where no country should be allowed to actually provide safe haven for cybercriminals. 
and they should be held accountable. Um, and that's what we need to get. There's a global um, cooperation of transparency when it comes to cybercrime. Let me ask Chenzi, is there any, um, any organizations outside of governments that are, that are helping with this and moving in the right direction? Please, anything else you wanted to say? Yeah, I think uh, they are, but it, it's difficult for these uh, for these organizations to really make quick movements because you really need government's consent. Um, so I, I remember a few years ago I moderated a panel with uh, a number of European cybersecurity leaders, and one of the guys on the panel, um, actually Howard Schmidt, uh, represented uh, the U.S., and, and he was saying that he was a former cybersecurity advisor to to the Obama uh, administration, and he was saying that if there was a large cyber criminal activity that was detected, uh, for instance, if they think it's perpetrated by a, a criminal group in Europe, there's usually a direct line from the administration to that government that they can pick up and call. For some countries, that's not the case. Uh, and so, for instance, you know, not to pick on China, <laughs> where I'm from, and, and he's like, well, there isn't a designated person on the other end that I could call to discuss the issue at hand and how we can work together. So it often becomes a negotiation and takes meandering processes to get it done, and it becomes a lot more difficult and, and really becomes a political discussion rather than let's get together and, and take down this criminal group. And I think... I totally agree with Joe that some kind of global consensus needs to happen so that regardless of what else is going on politically, this thread of collaboration has to happen because if we continue in this trajectory, it's not going to be good for anyone. All right. So there's some good questions coming in from the audience. A good one on IoT. I'll take in a minute. and Please keep the questions coming. But, um, Chenzi, this is a good pivot, too, and you, you hinted at this in the beginning. Um, and maybe you can tell us directly, um, you know, very cybercrime is obviously, I'm sure, different, but you're finding specific um, trends in Asia. Could you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I think um, – so I, I spent a little bit of time uh, this past year in Asia looking at uh, sort of the new businesses online, right? And if you think about emerging markets like China, uh, what's really interesting is payment mechanism like credit cards never really took off in, in that region. Uh, people just didn't take to it. Um, but now everybody is paying with their smartphones. There's Alipay is everywhere. There's uh, WeChat Pay is everywhere. Uh, even the, the old guy selling kebabs on the street has a QR code that's hanging on his car, and you can just scan the QR code and type in the number to pay him. And he's like, I don't want cash. In fact, he told me, he said, I don't want cash. Don't give me cash. I want you to pay WeChat. And, and given that uh, digital payment is so pervasive, it created a, a really new market for online fraud and uh, um, online abuse that, that never happened before. So what we're seeing is large um, attacks that, uh, as I said before, attacking business logic of these applications, right? Things like account takeover, application fraud, and, and also <laughs> another thing we didn't discuss earlier was uh, fake news. Um, in that part of the world, the fake news is a little bit less about political leanings really more about company reputation. So, for instance, um, if you're a large company and, and people know you're about to launch a product or, or launch some kind of new campaign, and the competitors might um, even uh, uh, use a, a multitude of channels such as social media, such as online search, and to put out some kind of negative news right before your product launch or right before your, your huge year and news, which will drive down your um, stock, mar uh, stock value. And then what we see is a particular group that would then swoop in and buy the stock. And, and those coordinated large-scale attacks happen a lot in that part of the world. And it happens in um, – uh, in the U.S. too, but we see a little bit less in the media than we we see it there. And I think because the pervasive of uh, digital systems and payment systems there, um, I will 
bet my uh, uh, my prediction is that I think the sophisticated online fraud attacks going to be perpetrated by Asian criminal groups um, before they get, they move over to this side of the world. Interesting, a lot of interesting stuff there. Let me ask Joseph. You're you're based in Estonia and. You have a large neighbor to the east that a lot of people have heard of. Um, you, the, any global perspectives there, you know, on, on any of this, on, on trends you see, and certainly get into the fake news if you want? Absolutely. Well, so so one of the things that we're seeing an increase in is, you know, we, we still we see the traditional, you know, cyber crime, the ransomware, the financial frauds, and so forth, and identity theft and uh, data stealing and so forth for, for either, um, you know, economic advantage and so forth. And of course, we do see the political side of things where, you know, you know, we've seen recently with the news from Germany that the government's been dealing with a, an attack for the past year or so. So we do see those, and that's, that's you know, seems to be a common occurrence these days. Uh, but one thing is definitely on the increase in more recent months is crypto jacking, um, you know, stealing computer resource power. Um, it kind of reminded me of, of going back when, you know, in kind of some of, kind of the early 2000s when you remember the SETI screensaver were we searching for actual thresholds when you weren't using your computer. Uh, now, today, when you're not using a computer, it's mining Bitcoins. Um, so that's, a, that's an issue that many organizations are, are starting to face, that they're starting to find that their, their computer resources are being hijacked. Uh, to even just recently, a hospital in the UK, um, some of their resources were actually mining Bitcoins because of the value of Bitcoin and the value that they can get on the return of that. Um, so we're starting to see uh, cyber criminals starting to, you know, steal back in, it's going kind of full swing again to stealing computing resources power in order, whether it's, you know, in the past it was used for, for you know, uh, cracking passwords, and now it's been used for, for uh, mining Bitcoins. So that seems to be a trend that's increasing, and it will continue to increase as I, as I see it, uh, you know, in the near future, as long as the, the, the value of cryptocurrencies are forcing it. Yeah, we also so, see... Um, please, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we also see the increase of uh, uh, you know, computing loads that, that uh, used to mine cryptocurrencies on public clouds. And there's a lot of uh, compromise of accounts and use uh, legitimate accounts to mine cryptocurrency, and then the bill goes to uh, the other person. The, um, and AWS has a lot of that. We see the increase on Azure as well uh, for these um, sort of compromised accounts used for mining of cryptocurrency. And there was a report, uh, gosh, some um, number of months ago, I can't identify now, which says that about, um, they think 30% of work on, on AWS is actually cryptocurrency mining and illegally. Yep. That's, 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 and that's, that's perfect segue that's, that's into, exactly. sorry, into, into my next question here. And please jump in, Joseph. Yep. But um, I just want to comment on this AWS thing. It seems like I, we hear so many examples. It's so easy to turn a server on in AWS, not to pick on them, other services as well. But it doesn't seem like there's very good security by default or, you know, they just say, it's here's your server, do whatever you want, and huge amount of hijacking. Please go ahead, Joseph. Absolutely. I mean, from AWS, you know, they make money from that themselves. It's just other people are unfortunately having to pay for that. Um, you know, it's better. It's, it, why is it easy to turn a server on? Because when it's on, it's making money for AWS. Um, so, so you know, we're starting to see that you know, um, cloud computing being being compromised in order to to do that resource. Um, other areas that I've seen as well, identity theft is probably a, a huge area as well. Um, identity theft, you know, has overtaken credit card and, and medical record theft in, in recent years. Where it's actually to the point where, where now we're seeing, on average per year, three billion identities in, uh, being stolen each year. Um, which means that that's almost every single person using the internet every single year is having their identity stolen. And then that identity is being abused either for um, terrorism activities to, to create fake documents, or it's been used for. Um, you know, ordering um, and uh, creating accounts and, and, and uh, banks and so forth in order to get credit limits. And so. so we're starting to see identities is a major area. Uh, one challenge that I've seen mostly, it's more of an issue in, in Western countries. I think uh, Zenzi mentioned it earlier about what they're seeing differently when it runs fake news. Because in Western countries, they can't be seen to interfere with, with, with news because it's interference with freedom of speech. However, um, the cyber criminals and political uh, patriots are taking advantage of that, that they are um, generating much more fake news 
to create uh, a confusion and to manipulate from a social stability issue. So it's an area that we're seeing uh, significantly increasing. Yeah, that's a, probably a topic for a whole nother, whole nother webinar. Let's come back to identity. I just wanted uh, maybe Chenzi, so just back to AWS. I understand they make money by you turning on a server. All you need is a credit card, and instead of buying a server and going through all the validation you used to have to with an organization, you just skip all the security. Shouldn't there be more responsibility on the service providers to you know, require a minimum, minimum level of security? Or what else should they be doing? So they are doing more and more, right? So it used to be the case that, you know, you have a, uh, the credentials and you can just log in, and um, but uh, private keys, like SSH keys can be compromised. And so now they're doing more of the IP blocking. They're doing a little bit more of uh, – they're providing second-factor authentication, but though you have to turn it on because, you know, it is not in their best interest, as Joe said, to make um, – initiating a, an AWS workload more difficult, right? So it's, it goes against the grain of their business. So um, it's, I think they are taking steps, but whether those steps are enough is, is up to debate. And I think organizations have to really be more vigilant and, and individuals as well, right? So one of the things I always say to everyone that I work with is if you don't have second factor authentication and you're uh, companies, AWS accounts, or, or any kind of, uh, you know, whether internally or externally for applications, then you're just asking for trouble, right? So that's one thing. Another thing is um, service providers today are, um, are sort of, uh, you know, their bottom lines also get increasingly um, uh, watered out, right? So um, they are looking at really a large volume business. It's not a you, you don't make a lot of money on one hour of server time. In fact, you're making it's a race to zero, right? So they're looking at uh, a, you know really minimum um, barrier to get anyone in, and because of that, we we are going to get uh, you know abuse of workloads and accounts. Um, so. But going back to the identity theft thing, um, I think one of the things that Joe mentioned is really important is identities being stolen to create um, things like contracts and, and loans and even medical records. Um, so one of the things, if you are a, an adult, um, these are the things that you could uh, you know, take upon yourself to work it out with credit agencies, though it's a, it's a uh, you know, takes a fair amount of effort. But what we are seeing is there's an actual increase in children identity being stolen. Um, so uh, I have a friend whose, whose daughter it was, uh, I think, eight years old, and just by accident, she did a credit check on her daughter's social security number and found out that uh, there were a number of frauds that, that registered on her number because her social security number was stolen and people created fake accounts and took out loans in her name, right? So if, if the mother didn't check it, by the time this, this daughter is using her social security number to apply for bank accounts or apply for loans, all this is going to be on her, right? So she's had a negative record, which will be very difficult for her to overcome. So um, I think these things, the media actually doesn't talk about a lot, and I love for, for some kind of um, – uh, press to to pay attention to this children identity being stolen problem. Correct. I, I, I've, 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 go I've ahead, Joe. Of, I have another question for you as well. Please go ahead. Sure. So I've actually I've done a quite a lot of research on that in the last five years, and um, yes, you know one of the things that it goes even this, the, the lowest I've seen is six year old children um, getting their identities stolen and, and getting loans and, and uh, taken out. And then the reason why is that it, it, parents will not find out until they go to university or school or until they get to turn 16 and 18. That's how long the, the, the actual dwell time for those types of criminal uh, activities are. It's another 10, 12 years before you'll find out. And this is a major issue. And so I think that, you know, another area is that children at that age also have very good credit rating, which is kind of interesting as well, that they can get easy, easy loans and, and financing. So it's something that absolutely that's a major issue that uh, does need to be addressed and has does need more visibility because unfortunately the news and media focus a lot on the political side of things which to be honest is less than one percent of all cybercrime. 
um, there's so much more out there that the media failed to cover. So let me ask you a hard question, um, and maybe you have a perspective from outside the U.S. I mean, we use this archaic social security number system, which is never intended for identity, and there's no kind of central, you know, identity authority in the U.S. But let's say my driver's license, my credit card, my date of birth, my address, my social security number, all have been compromised, and I'm sure they all have <laughs> in a database somewhere. How do I then prove who I am? I mean, you have these unchangeable things. My date of birth, I can't go apply for a new one. So, so this, this is actually interesting. And one, one of the things we were talking about the service provider side, the EU has taken a very different approach um, where, of course, they've focused that service providers are not liable for data breaches and data privacy issues. So there's a massive GDPR which comes into enforcement in May 25th this year. It takes a complete change in regulatory re requirements in the EU for data breaches, data breach notification, and also data privacy. So there's a massive change happening in the EU. Now, one of my views is that, unfortunately, the problem that we've done, and it's, we've kind of, it's almost like we've, we've, we've done it to ourselves, is we've used fixed um, personal data or fix, fixed personal identifiers as security controls, and that's the wrong thing to do. We have actually used personal fixed information to, con to secure data. And what we should have done, we should have made those public identifiers, and the security should not be, a it should not be ever your social security number. It should never be a fixed personal identifier like date of birth or your name or, or something. It should be something, you know, security controls should be changeable and should not be tied to your personal identity. They should be separated. And then your personal identity, your personal identifiable information should be public references. They should be all public. And therefore, one is it removes the, the interest of hackers targeting that because it's not public information. It reduces the value and the security controls are not tied to it. That's the mistake that we've made as an in industry. And we've actually caused ourselves, we need to change, we need to adopt and that needs to be removed as an issue in the future. Right. And I imagine that's going to be forced. Please, Shenzi, go ahead. Yeah, so in the, in the identity management world, we have a term for that. Um, the, uh, the numbers, identifiers like social security number or national ID are something we call identify as a person, but should not be necessarily using to authenticate a person. So there's a difference between identifying and authenticating. So what Joe is advocating is those identifiers should be left as they are identifiers, not authenticators. We have to come up Correct. with a secure way to authenticate a person not based entirely on the identifier, which is easily stolen. Um, and I see this kind of interesting way in, in, in Asia is uh, they ask your national ID everywhere. You go buy a train ticket, they say, what's your national ID? And you have to type it in or, or um, uh, scan it in on, on the machine. So the national ID number is just out there. Just, there's no way to control which application has it. But they don't use it for, uh, well, they use it as part of the, um, uh, the, the authenticating who you are in, in financial transactions. You have to provide many other pieces of data in order to get a loan or do a financial transaction. And that, in some ways, make it more difficult because in person to open up an account or, or uh, even in some parts of the world withdraw money. But um, it, it makes it a little bit more secure in the sense that, it, that the transaction is not dependent solely on your national ID number. Now, as those regions move to more digital transactions, that becomes a difficult issue. So I think that is still being worked out as we speak. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, it's, it's something that actually has been solved in Estonia uh, for many years now. Um, so Estonia has, has been one of the uh, kind of forward thinkers in digital nations and digital societies. And actually, every, every citizen in Estonia has a digital, a digital identity. Um, which can be used across systems. Uh, Estonians can create, uh, even e-residents of Estonia can, there's even, you can even become an e-resident of Estonia without even having to visit Estonia. Um, because once you prove your physical identity, once it gets tied to uh, your, your digital identity, um, and you can use that to open up bank accounts, to start a business, to vote, and, and so forth. So Estonia's been in the forefront um, of that for many years, and absolutely, we have a, a, a public identifier of the citizen, 
but then we also have a separation of authentication and a separation of also signing and change. So we have a digital signature which allows you to make changes also and sign contracts. And then that goes through blockchain for digital uh, non-repudiation. Yeah, so, great talk. Is, Sorry, go ahead, Jen, and then I'm going to pivot to other topics because this is a whole other webinar here I see mm -hmm. coming. Yeah, I was going to say that Estonia has really on the forefront of digital identity innovation, and you guys also have very good privacy laws for the country. So um, I think Western world, like the U.S., can learn a lot from you guys, even though our you know, regulation is slightly different, and, and digital uh, identity, the proper use of digital identity, I think it will be a, a study for years to come. So we'll pencil in another webinar on identity and many more on the GDPR because all the privacy issues we could easily spend more than an hour on. I like talking about it. But I want to bring in a question from the audience here. So um, a whole other vector here, IoT. Um, all this increased pace of automation, um, you know, not just people think of refrigerators and Fitbits, but, you know, what about industrial controls and water treatment plants and, you know, electric grids? Um, what are some of the, you know, the trends and, and how are we going to get ahead of this from this IoT and critical infrastructure standpoint? Yeah, so I can, I can take that um, and, and feel free to jump in, Joe. The, um, so I've been looking at some of the um, ICS security solutions uh, for uh, various reasons. And what is apparent is the systems of which that we use are extremely archaic and their protocols are all, are all proprietary, right? So, you know, Siemens use a, a one kind of protocol and Unilever maybe uses something else. So then you are looking at if you have different devices, then there is no standards of which or standard uh, protection mechanism. You just plug into your network or your endpoint to say, hey, you know, uh, uh, deploy this policy. So what we're seeing today in the, the forefront of ICS security is that people are painstakingly now reverse engineering these protocols. And so they are taking old Siemens equipment, they're taking uh, you know, those old equipments and, and putting in labs and reverse engineer what they are doing, how they are talking to different, um, and, uh, different components of the system, and then um, uh, provide visibility to uh, users. So there are a few new startups are doing this right now. There's one in Israel that's doing really well, and, and this is their uh, sort of um, secret sauce, right? So their product has built in visibility information for those uh, uh, proprietary protocols. Nobody knows what's going on. So they can tell you, hey, this uh, you know, water treatment plant is talking to a component that it should not be talking to, or uh, is sending a parameter that is outside of whack. But uh, those, those protection mechanisms are taking a really long time to come to the market, precisely because the amount of work that's involved. Um, so I'm hoping that our now that this you know the legacy is, is infrastructure is hard to change, but the newer digital infrastructure that's coming to the market, I'm hoping that we have standards of which that everybody abides by. So it's a little easier for a third-party solution to come in and do not only monitoring, reporting, but also protection. So I want to add in a comment. Thank you, Chen Zi. Um, we also do a lot in ICS. We're working with Schneider Electric and other companies. Um, it's a big problem, this, this legacy infrastructure, and just patching it because it's so old. They call it the iron tail of, you know, old systems that were had, I guess, security by obscurity and, you know, some isolation. But there is, I think, some urgency there. But, but Joseph, please, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so an area that I, I specialize in penetration testing of critical infrastructure like power stations and also maritime. And uh, over the years of being heavily involved in those industries, which are you know, heavily using industrial control systems for engines and sensors and valves and pressures, et cetera. And one of the things I find is that you know, if you look at traditional IT, you know, we had a typically life cycle of between three to five years of our, our technology, and it would ro rotate. Now, of course, sometimes longer than others because sometimes complexity gets involved. Uh, but when you look at a ship and you look at a power station, the lifespan is 20, 25 years, way beyond you know, traditional IT's life, life cycle. You know, how, you know, how old is your last mobile phone? 
So when you look at these systems, they are around for so long that, yes, patch management becomes an issue um, when it's been running for 15 years and when the actual protocols and the people who have the expertise are no longer there. And this is going to be a major challenge until those legacy systems are no longer in place, then these systems will always be at risk. And that means that we had to really, really think twice about how we connect them to the actual traditional internet or the, the open internet. Um, they will still have to have some type of proxy or some type of error gap or some type of controls that they're separated. And this is going to be a, a, an ongoing issue to take advantage of it at the same time where it's increasing a significant amount of risk as it, as it becomes more connected and more aligned. So, Chenzi, let me ask you this. So, we, we live in a very flawed world that will always be flawed. We have flaws in Intel chips. We have old infrastructure on unpatchable systems. We have vulnerabilities we don't know about. How can we safely run, you know, applications in this flawed Internet universe? So, um as you said, Willie, we we will live in the world that applications have flaws, systems have flaws, and that will continue, I think, probably indefinitely because it's to solve this problem is is uh, computer science using computer science lingo. It's an uh, it's an indecidable problem, right? So um, we can't produce software that's completely flaw free. That's just not possible. Um, it, once it goes beyond five ten lines, you host. So what that means is we have to look at compensating controls that allow us to see things in real time, allow us to detect abnormal signals or behaviors, allow us to respond right away. Right? So um, another line of work that I do a lot these days is in uh, DevOps systems where um, you have a ton of different uh, roles touching your production system it used to be the case that only the operational teams would touch your production servers and developers and testers are working in a different environment. It's no longer the case. Right? So everybody is pushing code onto your production server, not only for test purposes, but also for development purposes. So how do you then in this increasingly chaotic and real-time world uh, enforce your policy is a big issue. So what is happening is we see a lot of divide and conquer, right? So you get you get uh, applications that are going from monolithic to microservice oriented, and then you 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 have a hope of focusing on a particular individual component where you could derive a reliable baseline. I know some of the work uh, Versec is doing is along those lines as well. So you could say, hey, for this microservice component, maybe I can uh, develop a baseline behavior profile or or a call graph profile, which I can then use to enforce the right behavior in real time. And I don't care what the blacklisted files are, but I only care this particular component does the right thing. And, and I, I see a lot of new technologies emerging in the market is doing uh, um, uh, sort of providing solutions along those lines. I think that's a very exciting um, a direction for the technology to go. Uh, what's sort of still remained unsolved is some of the you know older arcade systems like, like critical infrastructure. And also uh, we have a lot of problems that, that having the vertical protection, right? So application is a problem. Now we're seeing that chips could have critical vulnerabilities that allow direct access to your servers. So how do we protect this um, infrastructure vertically from the chipset to firmware to your uh, you know, hypervisor or um, Docker and then to containers to application is still a, a challenging problem. Joseph, thoughts on that? I'm, there's a lot, lot to cover there. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in the grid computing concept where, you know, everything's stacked and individually, which means that you can update individual things very quickly and you can rebuild very quickly. And I think organizations who take it uh, into having their environments as, you know, microservices stacked on top of each other, and, you, know, you know, like using containers and virtualization hypervisors, I still believe that those are some of the most secure environments because, when when they do become corrupted or they do get attacked or they do get targeted, they're very easy to rebuild again. 
in large organizations, you know, because you just got the hardware stack and you have the instructions and rules of how to put it back together again. It's just for me, it's like, it's like you know, Lego bricks in an IT world. You can rebuild it very quickly once you know the instructions to do so. So absolutely, that's definitely from an IoT perspective, that's the way forward. Um, but the problem is, is that we're 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 in the early days, and we have 30 years of the past that needs to <laughs> to catch up. Um, I remember last year watching a satellite getting decommissioned, and the guy who was pushing the button that was actually d- designed and developed 30 years previously was hoping the button was going to do as it designed, and that's what we face in an IoT world. Yeah, interesting. All right, um, I, I want let's in the last 10 minutes just switch a little bit more to best practices and recommendations. Um, and I've got a few questions here. You guys can, you know, the, take any angle you want here. But, you know, how do companies avoid being the next Equifax? And, you know, aside from whatever management issues they had, you know, there's a lot that I think could, similar things could go wrong with other companies. And then, you know, how do they, how should you respond effectively to a breach? Maybe, Joseph, you want to start with that? Sure, absolutely. I mean, this, a lot of companies make the early mistake is by blaming employees. Um, and this is, this is the fundamental incorrect thing to do. And you should never do it publicly. You know, it should happen behind closed doors, and you just should never hear about that in a public scenario. We should be, um, our main focus is that we need to empower employees. The employees are our biggest, they're on the front line of cybercrime. They're getting attacked every single day more than, you know, organizations, you know, applications internally being attacked. So what we need to do is one of the things is to avoid being next Equifax. You really need to empower your employees to have a voice, to speak out, to ask for advice, to, to tell you when they see something suspicious. And, and we need to, that means that we need to invest equally in people as we do technology because technology alone will not solve this problem. We need to have a balance between what we invest in technology to secure our environments as well as the people who are using it and also who need the trust that it's actually doing its job. And, and Chenzi, any you know, specifics you, you recommend to companies now to, you know, to focus on? Yeah, I think um, you know, I totally agree with Joe. I think investing in your people um, is one of the, the more effective ways to increase your, the robustness of your defense posture in addition to technologies. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, technologies, there are a number of ways, um, in some of which we already discussed, such as moving from monolithic applications to more microservices applications where you have a lot more fine-grained control. Um, one of the uh, other tenets of that um, that I've seen that's working really well and is being adopted by some of the forefront uh, technology adopters is the concept of chaos engineering. Right? So Netflix does this really well. So what they do is they go around and they randomly uh, shutting down processes in their cloud and see how the system responds. And the uh, goal is for the system to be resilient. You can shut down a, a, a few processes, but things get moved around and things heal itself so that Netflix um, customers can still get their streaming services and whatnot. And I think uh, uh, taking this concept to security is a very, very interesting experiment, right? So um, a few of the companies I work with is now um, uh, sort of instituting a practice where uh, certain security controls will fail um, uh, purposely so that they could see how the system responds. So if your system can somehow uh, move itself, heal itself in a way that does not require a lot of manual effort, then you have, a, you have some kind of hope to defend against unpredicted attacks. Right? So uh, mm-hmm. cyber resiliency, I think, is, you know, the, the, be that <laughs> it is sort of a buzzword, but it has a lot of good um, uh, principles behind the word resiliency that we all should learn something from. So I, I'm hoping that the concept of, uh, of chaos engineering will be adopted by security practitioners to make their systems more robust and more resilient. I, I, just to comment on that, I completely agree. One of the things I always recommend businesses to do, for especially security teams, um, what we've done is sometimes we've become too routine and too predictable. 
and we do things on all these automation and schedules, and we don't practice chaos, which one of the things I find was that, and actually, this is actually important. I think is we, we sometimes never hear about the hacks that never happened, about the ones that we were successful at protecting, and, and we should sometimes be a little bit more open and vocal about it, but um, I was involved in one many years ago that um, we did a unpredictable, uh, unscheduled, unplanned, just because we had a gut feeling that something was missing, and we actually prevented um, ourselves ruling out a piece of malware that the actual criminal had embedded in our master software catalog to the entire organization. And it was that unpredictable, that chaos that we just said, let's do something that we weren't planned and hadn't been scheduled and wasn't automated. Let's do this on just on, on just a kind of uh, like a random time. And it was able to pick it up. And I recommend organizations, if you want to be, be kind of more um, kind of detecting and more resilient, you need to be, do things unpredictable and unplanned and unscheduled. And I would think coming back to the earlier discussions on AI maybe being used by the bad guys to find patterns, that, that's an interesting concept that if you're predictable, you're maybe, you're, <laughs> you're maybe creating more exposure. Exactly. So quick question. This is an easy question. I know it's a hard answer. Um, probably if you've never been the victim of ransomware, you know, should you pay a ransom? If you haven't been victimized, you probably say never. You're just encouraging them. You know, it's got to stop. If you have been victimized, maybe it's different. You know, have you dealt with with clients, uh, Chenzi, who've had to pay ransoms? Is it a bad idea? Do they do it anyway? Um, well, if you search for it, there are some cases online, like the Los Angeles Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, they paid seventeen thousand dollars in Bitcoin back in early 2017. I think that's probably a lot more now, <laughs> worth. Um, but the um, uh, many people actually pay because they are left to make the decision of do you protect your users, do you save lives in this moment, or do you abide by the principle that never negotiate with, uh, with somebody who, who demands a ransom. And I think uh, if it's a life and death decision, the, uh, the choice is pretty clear. Um, and I think uh, a number of years ago, uh, two years ago, I saw a report which said um, twice as much ransomware is actually installed on consumers' computers versus in, uh, in a business. And there are many consumers actually pay ransom, and you don't know about it. So our, you know, nobody's writing about it, and, and we don't hear those small, like a few hundred or sometimes a few thousand dollar payments. And I think the reason that ransomware, keep, ransomware attacks keep happening is that they work. People do pay ransom, so that is um, – it's a very, very difficult situation. Joseph, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is we have to look at you know, why people pay ransoms and if the really poor situation is that they don't have a good backup. Um, I always say that, you know, you, to avoid paying ransoms, always make sure you've got a solid backup plan. That's that's ultimately vital. And, of course, if you don't have and you find that you don't, you know, you're in a situation where you have to make the decision, the second option is you either then decide to continue forward without the data. Can you survive without having that data back? And then the third case is that if no, um, when it is those life and death situations or in some examples we've seen with law enforcement where potentially, you know, criminals are going to, you know, have all of their forensics data has been lost and therefore you're going to have, you know, serious criminals getting let go because the evidence is no longer available. So there's many situations where we have seen ultimately the, the rents have been paid, um, but it should be the last resort um, and it should be very seriously, you know, reasons for doing so. Um, my advice is not to do it unless it's a, a life and death situation. That's that's where it gets into. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That you know, better not uh, getting into that situation and, and have a solid backup at the beginning. All right. So um, we have a large audience. I'm going to be respectful of everyone's time. We're at the top of the hour. Um, great discussion, and we could go on for hours and should, so let's do this again. And I'd like to, first of all, thank Bright Talk for sponsoring this event. Um, they have a great series here with Ask the Experts and bringing in a lot of interesting people, so I encourage people to um, check out more of these. Um, also, uh, Versec and probably Psychotic have Bright Talk channels, so we also do a lot of events. Please check out our channel if you find something interesting. Um, you can find Chenzi all over the place, so I think we're all LinkedIn. 
Um, but I wanted to thank Joseph and Andy very much. Great discussion. And thanks to the audience for the interaction. And we hope to do this again soon. Thank you. Likewise. Thank Likewise. you.